All right, good evening. We have uh, June 11th here. Daylight is shining outside, and it's a fun day in Red Hook. This is our monthly meeting, and uh, we have a public hearing scheduled tonight on something, but given some audience members who might want to leave before listening to the whole meeting, we'll take you into consideration as well. Uh, the reason I'm holding the mic is we have a system with Panda where speakers or they have to be speaking to a mic at the DS or in the audience. So when it comes time to speak, we'd appreciate if you would just take the mic from us and stand at the lectern, if at all possible. That way we can hear what you need to say here and on P Panda TV 23 World. Uh, that being said, I'll take my seat and we'll start some official pieces. I thought what we would do is um, last month in May we had two meetings, the May 14th board meeting and then the May 17th workshop. We did circulate the minutes digitally. I do have printed copies here in case anybody had any additions, alterations, or corrections. And I would ask the board were there any that we should encompass and change in our official minutes. Hearing none, I would move that we accept the minutes as presented for May 14 and May 17. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. In our agenda there, you'll see 7 p.m. public hearing and then a police service proclamation. I can move the police service proclamation into the heading of when I do my report on the police activity in the month. Um, I'll explain that in a bit. I think um, for the sake of things, I don't think the public hearing will be that long on the moratorium we're talking about. Jay, I think in, in your pile, I gave you a copy of something that has like a bolded caption there, the title of it. So I thought maybe just read that into the record, please, sir. This the uh, two, 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 two for Do you have it handy or should I? month moratorium on all, okay. It's just the bolded part, like one paragraph there. Okay. Resolution by the Village Board of the Village of Red Hook authorizing adoption of a local law placing a four-month moratorium on all applications and permits for demolition of a structure over 120 square feet and for establishment, expansion, or modification of a motor vehicle service station in the GB General Business District. Shall I continue on? That's, that's good. That's okay, good. cool. Thank you. I just want to give a little heading. Those that are regular attendees and regular listeners will know that about six months ago, we put this moratorium in place and we created a zoning review committee to look at our wording. In particular, with those two points, Jay read automotive service stations and demolition in the general business district, which is essentially the village center. Um, the ZRC has done their work and presented some info to the board. I do feel I need to look a little further at the demolition piece of it. And then the timeline we have to do is for any local law and the zoning change is a local law. Um, we have to hold a public hearing and we have certain timelines with we have to have the County of Dutchess rule in on a 239M, which is a process where we show them what our proposed zoning change is and then they comment or not. We don't have that back yet. So tonight we would go through with the work on the public hearing, which we set at our last monthly meeting. And my personal stance is that we will not vote tonight on the actual extension of the moratorium. Just so folks know, we have one in place now for the past six months, and for logistical, legal reasons, we need a little more time to get it so it's ready to be incorporated in our law. So that's the four-month part. So essentially, board and folks, we're just extending what's in place for four months. Um, the board has had the benefit of reading the committee reports, and um, I don't think we need to get into that. It's just tonight we're talking about the extension itself. So. It's a little esoteric and uh, nothing too heavy in the, in the sense, but that's where we're sitting on it. Does the board any, anything to comment on that? Or? So to be proper and formal, Jay read the title of the basis of the public hearing. I described a little vignette background on it, so we formally should open the public hearing. Is there a motion to do so? So moved. A second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So it's open, and is there any public comment and what we do is we do ask if you have comment state who you are and we would give you the microphone too i know our regular attendees have been here for the first phase of it but if anybody else had a question or comment we'd be we would take comment i see a hand if you wouldn't mind roaming up and this should be spoken into 
Yeah. You can stand there if you like. Save yourself a trip. Hi, thanks for letting me uh, come and speaking. Uh, I'm a resident of the village. My name is Sally Dwyer McNulty. I live uh, close. Can I interrupt you for a minute? Sure. Are you going to comment on the public hearing at hand or your issue that you want to talk about? Of uh, the issue I was going to talk about. Okay. Not to cut you off, but right now this would be just on <laughs> okay. the issue that we introduced with Jay's reading. Oh, okay. So, so right. I'll wait. I'll okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Sally. Um, yeah, it's just a formality. We're not trying to cut you off or anything, mm -hmm. but for this piece, we would just have comment germane. Yeah. <laughs> right, psyched up. Um, but I think everybody here knows what we're talking about. I think the folks out there know. So with that, I would ask that we entertain a motion to close this public hearing. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye, thanks. Okay, we had to do that. Um, like I said, usually we go through a routine in our meetings, but since we have some visitor folks who have specific issues, we thought, I think we could let them go first. And if, if you choose to stay, you're always invited to stay longer, but the meetings run about an hour and 45 minutes, and uh, some gets very particular about small points, not big exciting issues. But, um, but with that being said, it's not a public hearing, but we could reverse our public comment, and I know you were trying to get a mic. We'll give it to you now. And, uh, <laughs> and then, like we said, just identify yourself. I did circulate. For real. Really? Okay. I did circulate to the board your letter, and they're familiar with the issue. But if you want to describe the issue and why you're here, and then what we can. It's talk actually about. just messing with you. He's going to do this a couple more times. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, thanks again for having me up here. Uh, uh, my name is Sally Dwyer McNulty. I live here in the village. I've lived here in the village for about. You want me to face this way? Yeah. Okay, I've lived here in the village for uh, about 18 years. And uh, let's see, we bought our home in the village so that we could be uh, close to the schools, uh, close to the village amenities. Uh, we like having neighbors. Uh, our, our neighbor, our backyard, uh, we abut five different properties, and so uh, we don't mind living close to people and um, kind of look forward to these relationships. And... Um, I, my husband and I were very surprised to see at the last week in May, uh, we've had a dog for about 12 years and one of the uh, enjoyable parts of living in the village is uh, walking through the, uh, the middle school and high school grounds. Um, for, for our purposes, not often on the grounds, just, just on the sidewalks uh, or to uh, sometimes just to cut through uh, to access uh, Linden Avenue. But uh, just that they, the schools have been not only a part of my children's lives, but also a part of uh, my husband and uh, my life and our dog, Ollie's life. And he is uh, getting older, he's 12 years old, doesn't walk very far, so that's kind of a perfect walk for us. And we were surprised to uh, come upon these signs. And there were several signs the first uh, evening that we saw them. I guess it was a Tuesday night, and we saw six signs that said no pets, uh, no pets on campus, uh, only service animals. Um, we hadn't heard any, um, you know, warnings that these signs were going up. Uh, the next day I uh, was without my dog and I was going down Linden Avenue. I saw three more signs. And uh, so there was a lot of um, kind of uh, quick attention to uh, uh, placing several signs uh, prohibiting animals uh, when that decision to prohibit animals was made. And so I was curious about how that decision was made, who made that decision. Uh, what was the rationale behind that decision? And I contacted uh, Paul Finch. He talked about uh, health issues. He talked about children being scared by strange dogs, uh, about uh, dog waste uh, on the fields, and uh, and so. Uh, but it, it didn't. It didn't really um, kind of, you know, make complete sense to me because I do see lots of neighbors uh, walking on the fields and enjoying the properties, enjoying the properties after the hours that the school children are there. And, um, and most of these neighbors I see have bags in their hands and in those bags are, is poop. And so they are uh, being responsible and I recognize that there are probably outliers uh, that some people don't pick up, uh, but um, I think that uh, I, I had no evidence about this. There was no documentation. Uh, there was no intermediate signage that encouraged 
um, dogs to be leashed, did no in intermediate signage that encouraged people to pick up uh, that were as widespread as these, saw, these signs that were just full out prohibiting the dogs. So I am um, I'm interested, and also this is, um, this is village property, is f from my understanding. You know, I live in the village, I pay village taxes. So I started to talk to my neighbors about it. And uh, I have 57 neighbors who have signed on to this letter, which uh, is asking that the school take down these signs and uh, replace them with more reasonable signs. Uh, we also mentioned at the end, end of the letter that uh, perhaps receptacles could be put up, but that's not a, something that, is, that we're tasking with the school. But uh, in other communities, having ready accessible you know, receptacles or bags is, is certainly a, uh, you know, one possibility. It doesn't have to be a remedy, but, but not consulting the villagers and not really kind of respecting, I think, the how we all are in this together as a community and we want to have we want to welcome adults onto this space adults without children uh, and we want them to um, and and I feel as though that the adults the presence of the adults is has been overlooked the fact that you have people coming to the uh, school grounds with their dogs is uh, is kind of uh, you know keeping eyes on the community. You have uh, young kids that after school hours are congregating uh, on the school property. And when they see an adult, they think twice about their behavior. They, they may disperse. Um, there are also people that don't leave dog waste, but actually pick up other people's dog waste. They pick up litter when they're there. Uh, it's, it's, it's a way to bring the community together, that the school's not only about uh, the children. Of course, it's primarily about the children, and we really care about the children. And, and I even think to, to myself about how pets are so important for socializing children and for teaching children about civic responsibility. So a sign that's instructive that says, please leash your dog, you're responsible for your dog's waste, uh, I think means a whole lot more to a young person than no dogs. I mean, this is a, this is a, a place of education, and we would like to educate our young people to be uh, civically responsible. And that's part of being responsible is picking up your dog waste. And we have to maybe educate all of our residents, but it's good to be reminded. And if as so many signs went up that could say no pets, I think so many signs could go up that say, please leave your dog and please pick up after your dog. Thank you. I know you brought a neighbor. This is your neighbor. Do you want to talk or do you want if you could, same thing, use the mic and just say who you are. Okay. Yeah, stand, you can stand by me or here. Okay. Um, my name is Amy Houston. I'm also a resident of the village. I live on Fraley Street. And um, I, uh, I am a member of the DLT committee, the district level team committee uh, at the school where this was discussed. And um, it was discussed several times. Um, there were some people that felt that the situation shouldn't be quite so black and white, um, which I was on the gray side rather than the black and white side of um, either it's no dogs allowed or dogs with conditions. So, um, so I would just like to reiterate what uh, my suggestions were at the time to see if we can come to a compromise <clears throat> and um, I was advocating for the fat for for the uh, condition that no dogs are allowed on the school property during school hours or during school events because if children are afraid of um, of dogs or something should happen there should be an altercation it shouldn't happen certainly during school hours or during school events. I think that that's a respectful stance to the school that's there, because it is the primary reason why the school grounds are there. Um, in addition, of course, if you are allowed to, if, if, if we were allowed to bring dogs on the property, it would only have to be um, um, uh, with a leash, and you would have to pick up after your dog, and if um, if there was one other suggestion, if the, if, if the um, which was mainly the athletic um, um, uh, staff that felt very strongly about no dogs on the field, at the very least, let us walk dogs on the paved areas, because there's lots of paved areas where you could walk. Um, and just 
uh, Sally talked about eyes on the community. Um, it was just a couple of weeks ago. I was walking my dog uh, through the parking lot, and I saw a group of young adolescents. They had, I don't know if they broke into or they were, um, or the bus was open, but they were in the buses, playing with the buses, honking the horns, making a lot of noise. They were uh, taunting us as we walked by. And as I got around, as I got past them, you know, I didn't feel, you know, that it was, I didn't feel particularly threatened, but it was certainly very uncomfortable. And they clearly, because it was on a Saturday or a Sunday, should not have been in the bus. I immediately texted Paul and said, Paul, there are four kids in the buses, you know, it, this doesn't look good. And, and right away he texted me back and said, I'm on it. And when I came back, um, I came back the same way to see if the kids were still there. In fact, they were gone, but the bus was wide open, the door was open, and I texted him again and said, Paul, the bus is open and, you know, this is probably not good. So I do think that having, um, I feel strongly having a community eyes on our property is a good thing, and it's also welcoming to the community that does use the grounds. Um, and I think, uh, um, oh, the other thing that I wanted to say is that when the letter went out to, um, to the community, because there was a letter that Paul sent out, that only went to people that have families in the school district. It did not go out to the full community. So they're really only talking to the school community instead of the, you know, everybody that lives in the village or the town that uses the property and should also be aware of what the restrictions are. So I think there's a lot of room to, um, to rethink the issue in terms of where there might be some gray areas. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Pardon me? You can just stand up and okay. I'll repeat it for you. Okay. Uh, I wanted to see what other community schools, what their policies were, so I went to, um, went down to Hyde Park and I went to Rhinebeck. Uh, and at Hyde Park uh, and at Rhinebeck, it's very clearly uh, indicated that there should be no dogs on the track. And so, and so within the track facility, no dogs. But on the grounds, I spoke to uh, uh, one of the grounds crew at Hyde Park, and I said, uh, "Do you have a policy that prohibits dogs?" And he said, "No, we just, you know, we ask our community members to pick up after their dogs. And we and they do." And I said, "Okay, thanks." And then I went to uh, Rhinebeck, and also no dogs on the track. Uh, but the uh, the signage had to do; it didn't have anything to do with pets. Uh, for the rest of the fields, it had to do with. Um, Prohibition against alcohol on the field. A um, no, and no one after 10 p.m. at night. Uh, but there was nothing about pets on, on, in their signage. So it just in our neighboring, you know, institutions, that doesn't seem to be the policy. Okay. Anybody else on that issue? I see a different face. I'd just like to say that I agree with everything they're saying. Okay. Good. Well, Fred, maybe since you haven't spoken yet, would you mind taking the mic and speaking? <laughs> no invocation, just talk about that. <laughs> uh, question with, but this sounds to me like um, a dog issue with people walking the dogs. But don't, aren't we in time, I said the village, involved with the town of Rhinebeck and they have next to the baseball field that big dog park there? Is that still an operational or what's happening with that? Yeah, they do have one. I don't know specifics about the town of Rhinebeck one though. Yeah, but. I think it is a shared facility with the town of Red Hook and the town of Rhinebeck. And it's my understanding that there's a fee associated with that. I don't think, I, I see people just walking in and out of there. Yeah. So it's free to the public. As far as I residents. know, it's free, or at least they don't. Have, it may there may be a charge, but there's no one there collection, doing the collection. But it is a joint effort, right, between Rhinebeck and Red Hook. It was about two years ago, maybe yeah, three I years ago. I seem to remember that. Somewhere in that area. Anything else, sir? Well, however, it 
isn't within walking distance of the village. Yeah, we could comment back, Charles. That's a good point. <laughs> you know, I'd like to say something. I lived on Linden Avenue for almost 25 years, and I raised three golden retrievers there, and I walked my dogs on the field, in the back fields and on school property almost every single day. I couldn't imagine not being able to do that. And they were on a leash, and I picked up after them. Problem with people not picking up. That's such a problem. Some well, places I mean, have put little buckets out there and stuff like that. Yeah, but what we could do, don't steal a mic, Fred. Um, <laughs> what we could do, we wanted to get your comment in, and when Sally first emailed me, it was kind of whimsical, because I had seen this sign, because I tend to walk the track without a dog. Um, to get some exercise, and it is a community asset. The whole campus is, is, an, is an asset. And I saw the no pet sign, and I kind of laughed to myself. I thought, well, wow, are the kids bringing pets to school? Like, it never crossed, it's, even the wording is not that clear to me. Like, what are they talking about? No pets. Um, but then I reached out to Paul Finch, and we do have a good relationship with Finch and the school board and so forth. And Sally and I were communicating, but I wanted the whole board and Panda and the audience to hear it. My personal position, and I think some other board members have reached out already to me, is it is a community asset. I want people to be clear, it's not a village ordinance. S some of the description, some people half listening might think it's something the village passed, but it's a school grounds issue and the people are using that acronym DLT and then the school board, I guess, would have had to vote. I'm not sure if they voted or how it happened, to be honest. But I would, in the regular business section of our meeting, I think we'll talk about, I would like to be authorized on behalf of the village board to send a letter raising that they should mimic something like our leash law and our dog control laws. I told Sally, I'm not too keen on the school providing a bin for waste in bags. That can get pretty funky, especially this time of year, and it'd be another chore for janitors and different things. But if you're the dog owner, walk in, walk out, <clears throat> carry in, carry out would seem to work for me. And Amy's suggestion, I don't think a lot of people should be on the campus during school hours anyway. It's, uh, it's, it's a place for kids and young adults. And uh, But I think we'll... Have you all been to the school board with this before? The school board meeting is on Wednesday, and they are uh, aware of the, the all, myself and my neighbors' concerns. They have the list of, of uh, concerned neighbors, and they have the letter. Uh, I also sent it to the DLT. Their meeting was moved from the 11th to the 18th. So I'll go to the board meeting first, and then the DLT next week. Cameraman, did you pick any of that up, or...? Should we repeat it? You got it? Okay. Because um, it's their policy, right, that set this? This is their policy, yes. It says red, the, the initials at the bottom of the signs are Red Hook School Districts, Red Hook Central School District, yes. Well, that's actually my question. Who, who has ultimate legal authority to decide how the school grounds are used? Is it schools? schools? Uh, let me repeat the question just in case you didn't get it. Um, the question was, in the end, who has ultimate authority over use and prohibitions of use at the school grounds? Is it the town, the village, or the school? The answer is it's private property by definition. It's, it's not village of Red Hook, it's municipal property. Um, but it's, to me, it's a separate, like a sister municipality. So they should listen to their colleagues in the other municipalities. And I think the sentiment you conveyed is, it's a campus, it's in the village center, they pay no taxes, um, we pay a lot of taxes to them, I think they should listen to us. <laughs> you know, it's a nice, quiet, safe place to walk. The views are astounding, um, especially sunset time, it's, it's an unbelievable place. So I had a question for you, Mr. Mayor. Oh. So as far as the enforcement of any policy, say there's a dog that deposits waste on the ground and it's against school policy, who, is the entity that would enforce any prohibitions or, or I any. have to believe that would be the village police would be the enforcers yeah no, I, I kind of think it's a little more gray it's like going into your backyard and saying your dog went in your backyard yeah, it's I, I'm just but, curious. But curious. There has it's to not, be somebody but, that has yeah. the enforcement authority. Yeah, I'm just curious now. So if there's a sign up there that says no pets allowed and there's someone with a pet, so what? Does 
what happens. Well, I think the flip side of your question, there probably is no real enforcement. We're not going to go, it's not a village ordinance. We have no authority to enforce anything, enforce anything but state law, village law, you know, so we couldn't. But, um, but I think if they mimic the village law and keep it it's the same spirit, it would be a known, you know, consistent with what it's on the street versus the sidewalk in their property. That to me would be the answer. And then I, I just think they jumped the gun and went ahead of the curve and now they're getting the backlash and they deserve it. So um, in the regular business, I think I would ask, like I said, the board, we would craft something. If I, I think we have consensus that it's abrupt and it's strong. Um, it's an overreach, it's not in community spirit, and we would try to do something. And I did talk to Finch. He did write back, oh, it's for health reasons, but I'm like, nah, I don't buy that. It's like, the dog, if the owner cleans up after the dog, it's, there's no issue. And I don't see that many dogs. I walk there probably three or four nights a week, and I don't see packs of dogs or unleashed dogs or things out of control, so. That'd be, but I think we'd have to. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she said, one of them said, uh, sometimes the walkers pick up. I But anyway, I think we'll wrap up that part of the discussion and we'll talk more about it in regular session. I, I would envision us drafting some sort of letter that we sent to the yeah. school board. And, and you're going to go tomorrow, what, what do you say, 13th, which is two, Wednesday, Wednesday night? Mm. I'm going to go Wednesday to the Board of Education meeting and then to the uh, district leader team meeting next week, which is on Monday. Mm. And we can, whatever we craft, we can email to Finch and maybe you give us some other names of players at the school board. I don't have all their emails, but. Okay, yes, I do um, have all their emails. And, and they've, been, they've been terrific about, you know, uh, you know, acknowledging receipt and looking forward to hearing from um, me and, and, and others. So I'm, you know, I'm encouraged. And, you know, I just wanted to, for a second, speak to Brent's point about, um, you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes we have to do our own enforcement, I think, in the village. I, I think, uh, you know, I, uh, if, uh, you know, if I see a, <laughs> sadly, I have seen kids beating up other kids and I say, hey, let go of that kid. Or, mm. or if I'm running on the fields and someone has had a dog off a leash, I say, call to them and I say, can you please put your dog on a leash? Uh, you know, and, and they, they do, they, you know, they respond to the call. But um, there was a study done in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, the, the dog density was uh, uh, coming up in a, um, or you know, increasing, and a graduate student did a study about there was a lot of getting you know animosity developing uh, among neighbors about this, and so, uh, but uh, these um, these signage and the kind of signage that uh, appeals to your responsibility appeals to um, to issues of health. Uh, please pick up after your dog. Uh, dog feces can spread disease. Um, this is uh, primarily a school, um, and we want to share it with our neighbors. Th this kind of wording goes far, but the prohibition uh, it really was was almost assaultive, uh, you know. And so I think that was that that was the issue. I mean, we of course we always want to work with the school, and we love having the school so close by. But I, th I think that uh, language means a lot here. You are an English teacher, aren't you? Or a no, I'm a history. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. <laughs> anyway. All right. So why don't we wrap that up? But we will craft something with the points we've bantied about. But I, we probably take off that. We don't want them collecting the waste there, so that we probably take that off the, for our board. But they could have the little boxes with the bag. Yeah. And you, you know, carry your little bag with you, just like you do in other places if they don't want to collect. I could. I think we sometimes veterinarians' offices donate those things because I know at Abrams Park we had that donated for us. Um, but but no poor janitor or highwayman for our village should be collecting dog waste in public drop facilities in my mind. So, but anyway, anyway, that being said, thank you. And we'll work on it. We'll do something. And then while we have the forum open we have people from the village talking about shuttle buses and so forth i have spoken to each of you individually and talked to most of the board we have some news since our last meeting but um did you want to say anything ray or mrs keeler or 
We have a special mic distributor here tonight. No, I just wanted to say thank you for what you did. We all appreciate it. Not having the bus coming down our street anymore. And uh, well, you can quasi thank us. Thank you. <laughs> but we, I have a resolution that will be like more formal steps that we have to take to make it more locked in. But I gave you the back, the back story. Pardon me. Um, but for a few board members that I haven't been able to speak to, and for the audience. Um, the local residents on Prince between South Broadway and Church in particular have been putting up with the student shuttle bus from Bard College and um, they raised more objections and certain things hit home last month and we sat with Bard. We did reach out after the meeting and talked with the director of transportation at Bard who we've had prior conversations with in prior years and um, it went up to Jim Bradwig's level and Dean of Students level and they listened to our input and then we did a trip. I got to ride in a smaller version, not the big bus, but I rode around in one of their buses and uh, one thing that changed the equation a lot in my opinion is recently the town of Red Hook reconfigured their parking lot and the suggestion we offered to Bard was keep the bus on the public Route 9 road and make your loop in the route nine town entrance to the parking lot for town hall and they did to their credit take the largest bus they use and they can make the swing so um, what they're offering in a way the timing is about as good as it can get because it's a summer when the big bus is no longer running and they have the ability if they change schedules to change schedules until a new crew of students arrives um, he did mention that they will have to modify their schedule Across the whole system, but they're willing to do that, and uh, and we have to do a few things technically and logistically, so we can make room for the bus to stop without uh, affecting parking much. And I do have a plan, so um, and we do have a resolution that we'll work on tonight. But I think it'll all work out, and so I see all pretty good outcome. What I'm trying to do too, I reached out to the county today because there's some. Um, the county transit authority, they, they no longer call it the loop bus, also runs through the Bard campus. And when I put the Bard, I said, why don't you guys just have the Bard students jump on the county bus and maybe diminish the size of your transportation department? And they said, well, the county charges 75 cents per ride, and apparently the students don't want to pay that. But it did pose, I haven't spoken to the administrator at the county level, but it did raise the possibility, would the county take a reduced fare? Would Bard have a card? Would somehow you reduce the need for as many buses and uh, but in conjunction and what I'm putting together is the county has a marked stop by the Chinese restaurant here but it's not a no parking stop so we try to get that in conjunction put them all in the same spot so the county bus and the barred bus can pull into the same little spot and then leave the county bus doesn't have that turnaround issue that the barred bus has and, and just to repeat some things we said last month there's almost about 150 barred students reside in the village in a given year and then we do know the clerks and people can watch the office they come in those that live here plus ones that need to shop and get entertainment it's they are a crucial part they they come in and they save individual car trips and they support the merchants the landlords so it's it's a positive thing for everybody to have a mass transit so we are trying to work with both sides, those that are directly affected on the street and then the barred student population. So, But anyway, I think we have something in your packets that could work. And uh, we'll I was, Yeah, I was just wondering too, or I know you resolved the issue with the big bus. Is it going to include you know, the smaller shuttles as well? Will they be turning yeah, around now? Yeah, do I envision it? Once the schedule changes, it doesn't matter what the vehicle is, yeah. it's going to go the same route. You know, That's so, great. Yeah. And that, I don't know if you contact the other day I mentioned the loop bus was turning around on Church Street and the yeah. driver said oh, I was told to you know make make a turn on church or you know mm -hmm. this the residential streets that's why I called and asked you about yeah, that too but Ray and I talked the other day that seemed like an anomaly but it was somebody on the loop transit bus cycle taking a break it sounded like and Parked his bus, is what I understood what you told yeah, me. He, well, he said he, he went to the library, but then he had to turn around to go back where he was coming yeah. from, and they told him to go through the side streets. And I was yeah, no, they are. But um, when I called the county administrator, I put that second piece on his voicemail. Like, I don't know what that was about, but we'd rather not have the bus 
taking breaks on the side streets. So thank you. Because, but uh oh, let's see. Where's the mic with Ray? Yeah. Okay. As far as the seventy-five cent fee, my daughter was taking classes at Dutchess Community College last year, and with her ID, she got on the bus for free. So I don't know if it's something mm -hmm. because it's community college and they have something worked out, but Bard could probably do Good something point. like that as well. Yeah, when he calls me back, I could talk to him because I did have one meeting with him unrelated to the barred shuttle issue, just meaning the route of the shuttle was more like, why have two buses going through the same campus? Can you guys join up somehow? And, but anyway. Yeah, I just wanted to, I, did, I too wanted to thank the board for working on that issue. It's greatly appreciated. Okay, so, thanks. Thank and we'll get into the details. I think we hit the first part. We had Fred Cartier come in, and I think you're representing the fire company. Usually we let them give their report because they have to go off to a training or a meeting or a drill. I see a lot of papers in your hands. Do you want to take a mic from Danielle and we'll get that part done too. Feels funny being in front of the camera over there after many years. Anyway, I'm Fred Cartier. I'm the liaison to the village from the fire company. And we'll be coming here monthly. Good. And to make certain reports or whatever and answer questions, or at least if you have questions, I'll come back with the answers. I've been in the fire company for 40 years. Um, I've, I'm on the board. And you probably see me directing traffic and <laughs> giving me dirty eyes as I'm pushing you down in the wrong streets you don't want to go. But that's all part of the business. Uh, some general information that has been requested and I, I have here. Uh, first of all, the uh, membership is, a, is, is approximately 34, 34, 35. Uh, and I did that by counting the pagers that we have. We all carry pagers and we have 36 of those. and. Uh, all of them are out, so I assume that's all members. Of that, um, 36 are fire personnel, uh, 18 are, are uh, in, what we call interior fire people. They, they have special training, and they go inside of the buildings. Uh, there are people, exteriors, who stay outside and do support. Uh, there's three uh, fire police. Uh, and we have four EMT, EMTs, and then we have nine what I call miscellaneous because I'm not sure what they do, but that's beside the point. Um, we've been in operation here in the village for 99 years, uh, and we are celebrate, getting ready to celebrate our 100th um, anniversary next year. We're trying to get the county to have us, to have their, each year, each summer they have a, a big festival of all the fire companies. And uh, this, this summer, or next summer I guess it is, it'll be here in, in Red Hook. So that's the information I have there on, on that. Um, the, you asked for a liability of insurance? Uh, building was the direct, we have a building, building, yeah. right, the building was it. And uh, you also wanted to know the calls for the last month. We had 37 fires and uh, 62 EMS calls. Um, and that's between the village and the town. Do you know specifically, Fred, if how many... I'm sorry? Go ahead. Do you know specifically how many village calls you had of each of those two Would categories? Not, I was told, totally, I asked that just before I came over here. Uh, I'll try to get that for us. I don't have, we don't have that. Um, you, to do that, you've got to reset up the program they use in the computer, but I think we could do that just looking at the sheet, the call sheets themselves okay. and, and come up with that offer. <clears throat> Thanks. Okay. So... Uh, if not, any other, any other questions that anybody has? Yeah, two I, things, Fred, uh, from here. Um, thanks for bringing in all that information, and thanks for coming tonight. One thing was the LOSAP. It's a time-sensitive thing for us to – that's the Volunteer Fireman I, I Benefits about, Program. Yeah, I asked about that. Uh, there's a copy hanging on the bulletin board over there, and I said, well, can I take that? And they said, well, we ha it's got to be up so many days. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so uh, when it's up there so many days, then I will see that you okay, get good. a copy of that. Okay? That's a benefit the two municipalities 
town and Phil Zeretic voted in a decade ago probably where it's a, it's a defined contribution. To, it's, it's a version of a 401k for volunteer firemen, but we fund it, but it's based on their attendance at calls, drills, meetings. It's a point system where they have to qualify to get in. I have no idea how you all figured it out. It's a magic it formula. It goes to actuary type folks and investment company, and but, but we need the base data to get it moving, but thanks. And then I know Fred Brent's question, that there, we were given earlier reports, we don't need it tonight, but if you could ask, um, it does give a breakout because what we're doing is the town and the village contract separately with the fire company for protection and we're just trying to make sure the call volume and percentages match up to the way we're sharing the funding. So when you get a chance, it is a computer run that Rob wrote in once. It lists address and EMS, fire, different categories. Well, just so between the town, what, what calls do we have in the town and what calls we have in the uh, building? And, and we can do the math. It's just a printout and then what we were doing is we can separate out ourselves from, from a print. Well, there is a form. We, we do have, if you want to do that type of way, we do have the, um, I'll give you a, sh a listing of all the calls yeah, we that's, made. Yeah, that's perfect. That's all we okay. need. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, that's what Rob was dropping off, and then we could analyze it. And if you have that, we'll take that. But thank you. Got it. Oh, thanks for coming in. Appreciate it. I'm glad we met. If you want to hand that to Cindy, she can... All right. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. All right. I guess we can move into our normal routine, a little out of sequence, but let's go for it. Um, today, like we said, is June 11th. So what, Cindy, we're 11 days into our new fiscal year? Yes. And we have a rather complex treasurer's report because of that you'll see in your packets one with expenses and fund balances as of June 11 today. And then further back in, well, I guess on the top sheet, she gave a May 31 date and a June 11, and further in, it's thicker because there's two computer runs. Folks, okay. oh, you go in the back halls if you want to chat. Okay, stage, stage right. Stage uh, so anyway, um, the looking at it, it's a little different than what we normally see. But if you look in the bolded section, at fiscal year end May 31, the fund, the general fund, had a balance of $271,000 and 89 cents in it. Then above it, you can see it's up to 410,000 because right now taxes are rolling in um, already in the mail, so they're making deposits of the New Year's taxes. The water fund, likewise, let's see, that ended the year with 154000 and that's not included. That doesn't increase with a tax billing cycle, so that to its normal spending cycles is now $147,585. Trust and agency, $35,178. Materials management, we'll have to talk about later, but it's when Jen reports, we'll go into some details and data, but... It's down to $495.75. And I checked last month, the report showed it was just under $3,000 in that f account balance there. Village Green has $3,331.78. Hard Scrabble, $4,623.84. Health Insurance, $4,026.27. And right now, there's no money sitting in the capital project funds. As far as expenses, Cindy did the same thing. Um, for the May 31 time frame, the expenses in general fund were $113,316. And uh, in your voucher packets that you're signing, you'll see same thing, two, two voucher packets. Um, the newer one is dated the June 11th year to date I put on there. And there's $70,339 spent year to date. Sounds like a crazy high number in 11 days, but the reason is we renew our insurance policy, which is our property and our auto and our liability coverages, and that's about 61 or 62,000 of that 70,000. So it's not like we want a big spree or anything. It's just a, one big expense comes in. Water fund, let's see if I can get these lines lined up. The expenses for the true month of May were 11,333, and in the part of 
June so far, the expenses were 5,155. Trust and agency, looks like expenses were 35,178. And materials management expenses were $3,208. What I did, if I was paying more attention to the fiscal year end part of the general fund, and I made a lot of highlights and notes, and Cindy and I were checking on a few things. One that jumped out to me was in the actual tax levy line for the prior fiscal year. It shows us not bringing in about $13,000 of revenue, which seems odd. So Cindy's going to check the records. As you know, if somebody does not pay their taxes in the village, we have the recourse of going through the county who reimburses us, and then they take the legal action that's necessary. In most cases, people end up paying before they head for a tax foreclosure, but but in my mind, those numbers should match up. Something, would you say, yeah. you have to dig into some deposits? Um, and I did want to mention also that I received funds from Homeland Security. Oh, yeah, for what? For Stella, Storm Stella in 2017 oh, for $17,846. And that's only the federal share. The state share is yet to come. That's FEMA then. FEMA. Yeah. I'll give, yeah, Brent spoke lowly up here, but... This project drove me nuts. Um, when Cindy said Homeland Security, it's the mother entity for FEMA that we talk about. And um, that's awesome because the storm was actually 18 months ago. It was the March storm of the prior winter. And uh, probably you said the truck, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have a motion to on the books for something. Um, but I think we submitted about $24,000 worth of claim, and they pay... I think 85%, some fed, some uh, some um, state. So this is that's great because yeah. it's really good, actually. But that's not in these numbers? It is. Which one? The new ones. New ones, okay. It was put in at 6.5. June 5th, But it'll, okay. in the AUD, it'll go back because yeah. it was submitted back. Okay. Um, where I was headed before she gave us that good news was if you look at general fund, June, 17, June of 2017 through May of 2018, um, it gives a bottom line. In, in essence, what we budgeted was $1.884 million in expenses. It looks like we spent $1.801 million, so we have a positive of about $82,000. Like she said that twenty will get retro-funded. I don't know if they'll go back to the 17 year, where they're going to put that, but it's going to go somewhere. Um, and then... Like you said, that thirteen thousand dollars shortfall in revenue might make that eighty-three more like ninety-five thousand, and then there are always a few lingering, straggling expenses. Um, yeah, that's revenue though, but still some expenses. We're only eleven days into the new month. We might get a bill for the prior fiscal year. So, but overall, it looks pretty good to both Cindy and I. We'll answer some of those questions on that revenue piece. But. That being said, um, is there a motion to accept the treasurer's report as submitted? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks. I'll go police report. Um, what we were thinking of doing tonight was um, until the sergeant didn't get into work today, uh, we wanted to issue a couple of proclamations. We had about 10 days or so ago, um, two of our, of our officers responded to a non-responsive female at the Stewart's parking lot. And when they got there, it turns out it was a drug overdose. And um, all of our folks are skilled and trained in Narcan, and we have Narcan in their possession, and they were able to revive the person. And they had assistance from Northern Dutchess Paramedics and the uh, Red Hook Fire Company with ambulance crews and so forth. I understand the person has already sent one of the officers a thank you note or something, but we wanted to publicly thank them, and I drew up some proclamations, but the one guy went off duty at 4 o'clock today, and I think he had enough of work in here today. And then uh, we're also strict on the budget, and they have a, in their union contracts, if they come back, there's a three-hour minimum, so it would cost us three hours to give them a proclamation. And we're still pretty tight with the money, so. <laughs> but um, seriously, though, we want to thank it was Officer Sterrett and Officer Patrick Ferry that responded, and apparently what it was, just the quickness and the proximity that they could get there that quickly was um, what really turned the day. 
And what about a month or six weeks ago, it wasn't in the village, but there was a heroin over, overdose death. And uh, this one they prevented, and hopefully the person can get the right help and the right counseling and the right steps to correct the problem and not require another visit like that. But again, thanks to Sturd and to Ferry if they're watching, and then uh, we'll give them their proclamation when we see them play in person. On the number side of it, in that count, that, that, that story I just told you, it's one of 352 incidents that they responded to in the last month there. Breaks out 246 in the village of Red Hook, 96 in the town of Red Hook, and 10 in the village of Tivoli. They had written last month 95 traffic tickets. That breaks out 60 in the village and 35 in the town. And arrests were 21. The breakdown is 12 in the village and 9 in the town. And uh, I'm just curious, we always wonder what they're doing in Tivoli. It's like an alarm, a lockout, mental health, noise complaint. Oh. Lost property. We don't routinely patrol Tivoli. It's just uh, if we get a call, we'll, we will go there if nobody else is available. Anyway, we do keep a spreadsheet too, like we're doing with the fire company. The police department is one of our responsibilities as a village board, and um, we do break out calls and incidents and tickets by a locality so we can make sure we're charging the town the right amount. We don't ride and work in a town for free. We have a contract with them too. So that's that report. We talked about insurance a little bit. That's one of my responsibilities on the sheet in front of you. And um, like we said, we've gone through and reevaluated all our buildings this year with the insurance company and looked at all our coverages. We've got the renewal policies here and uh, it's, a, it's an actual booklet about 200 pages thick, and we found we have good coverage, and we have a great agent, and we work with them to keep it up. It was one reason we are pushing the fire company, because the village actually owns the firehouse, and we, but the fire company pays for the insurance on the firehouse under the terms of the lease. So they, the numbers, they conveyed some email to me today since 4 o'clock, which looks like they're in the ballpark for what it's worth, too. So that was, that was one of our concerns. All right. So excuse me for banging. Um, Mr. Trapp, do you have enough to work with there to do a planning zoning report of some I do. Sort? Let's see here. First, uh, let's see, just chat briefly about the Dutchess County Planning Federation Board of Directors. And we have the third and final session of our spring, spring classes this year. Uh, it will be this coming Thursday, the 14th, at 6 p.m., 6 to 8. There will be credits given for planning and zoning board members as well as these credits may be for code enforcement officers as electives. So. Uh, the class is going to be about uh, mistakes in land use and CECRA, which is the State Environmental Quality Review Act. And uh, it's going to be presented by two gentlemen from Osterman, Whiteman, and Hannah, who wrote the book on a lot of this stuff around here. And uh, David Everett is one of the gentlemen, and the second man's name escapes me at this point. But six to eight, Millbrook. Cornell Cooperative Extension, um, the Village of Red Hook will pay for any planning and zoning member that uh, goes. And like always, we feed you uh, cookies and tea and coffee and sodas and salads and wraps and things like this. So we try and get you there, get you fed. And as you know, the Nolans said you want to have a good meeting, you have food always. So <coughs> that's the way we, uh, we roll there, I suppose. Uh, so. This Thursday, I don't know whether you're attending, George. No, okay. But uh, hopefully, we'll have uh, uh, a good many folks there. We've had pretty pretty good attendance throughout the uh, first two classes, and we will be meeting after this to start lining up our fall classes. We're not sure at this point yet, but we will do the three that we generally do. And um, I was looking at. Uh, in, in my, 
my other job, my real life job, um, I've started writing grants for a municipality and I came across a facility where you, uh, fire grants are available. And I just started looking at that today to see what can be had and uh, I was gonna reach out and maybe <coughs> we'll talk to Robbie and some of the fellows down there and find out what kind of things they need and see if these two, the need and the grant will link up to be anything that might be of use to them. So Good. more on that as I near in on it. So in the world of the uh, building and planning and zoning, there were 12 building permits issued uh, in May. Uh, no certificates of occupancy were issued. Three certificates of compliance were issued. Two municipal searches were conducted, no orders to remedy, no stop work, and no court appearances. Uh, all 2018 fire inspections were completed for all of the uh, Bayright Realty properties. And uh, there was one complaint and uh, uh, no order of remedy was required. I assume it was resolved at that point. And um, there's an inspection report. Uh, the planning board, wow, planning board had a pretty full agenda of five items, uh, meeting 2018, May 17th. Uh, three signs, uh, resolution to amend the site plan and the site plan application for South Broadway property. Uh, and again, no business for you guys, George. Sorry about that. Uh, no Zoning Board of Appeals agenda for May 2018. And uh, the uh, funds that were taken in uh, in the month of May, $935 in the building department. And it uh, looks like uh, basically a span of items here. So okay. looking pretty good. Um, again, don't forget, Planning Federation classes Thursday. I think that's okay. it for me. Ed. Thank oh. you. Good. Thank you, Jake. You bet. Just to remind the board and whoever's out there thinking they might need the building department, effective June 1, the board did install and formally uh, put in place that new rate schedule for permits and different things that the planning board deals with. So um, Lara has that copy and everybody's aware of it and so she's working off that. And uh, it's been a while since we did that and we did a lot of research and updated that. But thank you, Jay. Yes. And then um, let's see, I guess we'll go to Ms. Norris. Would you like to talk about what's on your sure. program there? Let's start with the fun stuff and then we'll do okay. Good. Um, Hard Scrabble Day is Saturday, September 15th. We're still working on getting a band and updating our website and vendor stuff and all that jazz, but we'll go on Saturday, September 15th. Um, the library will have their kickoff Red Hook Rocks 5 to 8 this Friday, June 15th, their third annual Summer Front Porch Concert Series. The series is comprised of three, five, I'm sorry, three free live outdoor concerts over the course of June, July, and August. Participants are invited to bring blankets or chairs and picnic dinners to relax on the lawn. The library will provide fresh lemonade and shade tents. All ages are welcome and no registration is necessary. Um, there are a ton of summer camps going on um, at the library and all sorts of different um, I don't know what the word is, but there's science, there's music, there's theater, there's film, there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff, so check out uh, the library for that. Um, the Red Hook Senior Services Committee is having a food drive on Tuesday, June 19th from 1 to 3 and 6 to 8 uh, at the Red Hook Firehouse. This is for children in our district on the reduced breakfast and lunch program so that we can provide them food uh, throughout the summer when they wouldn't be having uh, cafeteria stuff so Jen what is that you bring dry goods or whatever yeah I believe you know any non-perishables and dry goods and okay because I know we have it up on our website and some posters yeah but, the, okay. there's um Red Hook Harvest is another uh organization that does food drives for children over the summer so the the more the more the better for sure um so there you go uh and now onto the fun and challenging world of materials management um, for the month of May, we sold $2,678.50 in tags and paid out $1,424.83. We had 12.17 tons of garbage, 4.78 tons of single stream recycling, and 0.18 tons of contaminated recycling. 
we are discussing with uh, UCRRA, who takes our garbage in recycling, the possibility of having to return to commingled um, and can glass recycling rather than continuing single stream. Uh, this is a national issue, not just uh, statewide, not just us. Uh, China's leaving the market and other countries are not able to take in the volume of recycling. Um, but Ed, you've been talking with them and this is an ongoing thing and I don't know that it would you know that we would make a, a change now. It's it's just this is well, this is looking like this is probably what we're going to have to do um, yeah, down the keep, road. Keep talking, and I think we should discuss a little bit here while we're on. <laughs> I don't have anything just, else to say. Pardon me. <laughs> I said I don't have anything else to say. Okay, but uh, Jen gave me a, a kind of backdoor compliment. National issue, and I'm talking. She said, "Well, somebody sounds like I'm talking with the Chinese." But bad Did news not is, say that. I'm not. Um, <laughs> nor the North Koreans. But anyway. Um, oh, it's uh, but was, we're looking at uh, as far as us up here to think about, and we could talk in workshop too. Our next newsletter comes out in a couple of weeks, June water newsletter. So it might be time to communicate something. Um, like Jen said, I've been talking with the director over at Ulster County Resource Recovery Authority, which is where we take our garbage and our recycling. And, and like she said, it's the national issue that the market is essentially dropping out of single stream recycling. The county agency that I mentioned does have a MRF, M-U-R-F, that's another acronym for they can actually sort commingled. It seems like the high market is still in good, clean newspaper. And then there's a pretty good market still in cans, glass, plastic separately. The problem becomes when you single stream it, the broken glass pollutes the cleaner newspaper and the smudge inside of a yogurt thing gets on the newspaper. So it's like, and the, the market is reacting to that negatively. He, you can remember in us, we used to be totally free for single stream. Then we're starting at these $20 charges. He says now it's costing them $47 a ton and they just trans ship. They don't even sort it at their facility because they can't to a site in Beacon. And he thinks it might go to $70 a ton and they just can't absorb that. So to me, the trend would be we're going to get pushed from zero to 20, which we're at now to somewhere up around 70, um, which just doesn't work for a lot of reasons. Um, but we could move back to our old commingle days where we have clean newspaper bailed up, sorted at the curbside by folks. And then I was trying to recreate in my mind, I think I circulated something to all of you. We had a sequence where the guys, because you don't want to then throw the newspaper in the same trailer as the commingled because you're doing the same thing. You're then kind of single streaming in the trailer. The trailer thing. was partitioned. Yeah, uh, I remember it, it that. Was on the same Day, wasn't yeah. it? Like I just remember, you know, your cardboard and whatever as it was in one thing, and your yep. cans and glasses were in another. But I don't remember. If they partitioned the trailer. Uh, I remember the partition, cans. but then did they need two trips? Or they made more trips mm. because yeah. you know the, each partition fills. Yeah, you have half the time and room. Um, so it was more cost effective to do, you know, single stream, but they did it all in one pickup. So that the customer would not notice a difference. You would just, right. you couldn't single stream anymore, but right. you would you put everything have, out the same day. You have to divide, which yeah. is kind of a drag. So cardboard and paper and one half of the trailer and plastic and bottles and the other half. So if I have to sit with the highway guys, because um, one option, when I talked to Dan about it, just to some pre-thinking, he said he thought it was... One day a month, they took all the newspaper, then three other Mondays took the commingled and the guard, you know. And uh, in a way, the newspaper stays better. You can put it if you tie right, it up, you know. Right, you wouldn't want your funky cans and things sitting around for once a month. But so maybe I'll talk to him a little bit. And because what I was trying to do was some other math when we we're looking at the treasury report, the uh, the balance in material management is dropping where but the one test we have to ask ourselves or answer is um the same market change that's affecting us with the rate is also going to affect what we call the big boys it's they can never they can't take the same single stream either. they're going to have to either charge more for that one can of recycling up to that if it goes because ulster county does accept welsh's waste there and i don't know where else royal royal to me is the same company they're the same ownership so um, the point is, the regular private sector folks are going to have to pay more too. Um, so what do we do? I think for now, it looks when you do the math, we probably Dan is going to take. I said go buy a clicker. We're going to actually count our customers, and 
see what we have somehow so we can know what we serve. But I think probably everybody on the board is a customer. And it's still a very effective system. And I explained again to the highway foreman that, that one day of tag sales offsets the need of the general fund to pay that day of labor. So it's, it's good. And we have incredible recycling rates, like I said. Um, but we're going to have to do something. And how do you convert the method? It's going to be hard for the public to get the message. But we'd have to use the June newsletter could be the best time to do it. My gut feeling is we're going to have to head back to commingled and pick up this zero rate on the, the recycling and then no longer have single stream. I mean, I think, you know, the idea of doing three weeks for bottles and plastics and one week for paper makes, I think it's more cost effective, but how do people, I guess it's a matter of time before people start getting into which yeah. week is what. Yeah, that'd you know? be the... I think that'd be the hard part. Yeah. I agree. Uh, yeah. Well, so this seems like it changes every couple of years and throws people off kilter. Yeah, what single stream isn't that long? What, two years at the most, yeah. maybe? It's, uh, it was sort of a godsend. It was like, wow, it's well, just one, so <laughs> so one thing and done, you know, but not working out. Yeah. And um, so I could remind Dan that it was a split trailer and that. Um, We'll probably craft something for the June newsletter to start it in, I would say probably September somewhere, give people enough time. And I think, the, too, another option would be you know, if they went to, with the recycling truck to make the rounds with plastic, and then it's still not a cost effect, and then come around the second time for paper. Um, it just seems like just a lot of wasted yeah, time and money. Truck use and... Is really not an efficient way of doing it. Anyway, we'll, we'll all think about it. Yeah. Keep your eyes peeled to the newsletter. We'll have something there. What else do you have there, Ms. Norris? Anything? All right. Do, do, do. Why don't we slide to water, Mr. Lang? And I don't know if you want to update. I know we've been pushing some LED streetlight stories back and forth to each other as far as some emails. And if we could chat about that as you get to that phase. But Yes. Okay. But first off, uh, how about the monthly water treatment facilities report? Um, so for the month of May... The water treatment facility treated 5,906,000 total gallons, which is an average of 190,500 gallons per day. Uh, and I have, for my edification, a little uh, annual daily average flow, and that is the lowest uh, usage over the course of the past year, which is very promising. Mm -hmm. um, all bacteriological samples for the month were collected and transported to Smith Environmental Laboratory in Hyde Park, and uh, all three samples came back uh, clean. Uh, no uh, coliform or E. coli were detected. Um, and during the, I think it says month of April, but I believe they yeah, mean May. Should be made. Uh, the water treatment plant used 50 gallons of sodium hypochlorite, uh, and so that translates to an average daily use of 1.61 gallons per day, which again sounds uh, very low. So um, that's the water report. Okay. I know we did mail out individual annual drinking water quality reports, which everybody in the village received. Um, and yeah, then we have, for us, uh, the operator gives comments on some technical things we're pushing them on. Um, yeah, that's good. He's keeping track of uh, work orders and outstanding yeah. issues. So I think, uh, you know, yeah. he's doing a, a good job of making sure that, you know, people aren't left scratching their heads about this. Yeah, it looks like they did honor... Our request, they, they give a bigger sheet of the daily consumption that they make the average from. But Charlie, you're right, 190 is, I think, one of the lowest we've seen in a while. And uh, It is. I know we did fix a leak. Um, Tower Street 
what, two or three weeks ago? Mm -hmm. Was that, um, and one has to wonder, you know, what was that doing? Did it finally make its presence known? And uh, therefore, the 190 is a better looking number. Right. But uh, it wasn't a gusher, but maybe it was below grade and below visibility, and who knows? But, uh, uh, so cause for phase three someday down the road of mm. the continuing water project. <clears throat> Did you want to talk about the LED world? Um, just update folks a little bit now. Let's see. We do have it in the general business section too. Um, I guess I could jump in and say we did circulate to legal at 47 page power authority. Well, and that, that was a little while ago. So yeah. have we any response? From he, he wrote back, he said essentially it's boilerplate, um, but by state agency, so it takes 47 pages of boilerplate. Right, I understand um, that, working for a large agency. Um, but he did say one thing that threw me in it toward the end is an appendix or an exhibit that says, based on size of project, they take a percentage of the, the, the overall cost as their, their fee to handle it for us, which when we were working with the consortium, I was like, well, there's no fee there, and then the power authority seems to be the default point where it's headed, but, but, and it's, in our case, I think it's 12 and a half or 15%. I don't have it right in front of me, but, and the job is, I do. oh yeah, okay. Um, it's one of the appendices, um, but the job is what, 250,000, you know, it's say 300,000 overall. Um, right. So it's, it's a, f it, it'll delay the payback a little bit. I think what they've shown me with that number in there is like 3.7 years is the, the the payback versus some of the earlier projections, but it's still. Okay. I mean, it's still, I think, generally in line with uh, the schedule of yeah. you know, paying this off. Yeah. But it does seem a little bit of slightly bait and switch with working with the consortium. And the major benefit of working with the consortium was that they were doing this all for free, basically. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, um, but you also reached out to the town. Uh, because they are going through the same process just a little bit further ahead than us. Yeah. Um, I connected. I know I talked to council and I reached out to um, the fellow Leno, I think his name is, the guy at NIPA, New York Power Authority. Um, right. Um, let's just see what I can find. So let's see if I can find his most recent communication. We've been approved. <laughs> yeah. But I did respond to this May 3rd note. I'm just looking for, uh, that's where he said, I gave him a current Central Hudson bill and he gave a 3.7 year payback. Well, let's see if we can find him by a different search. Hang in there. <laughs> this is what Cindy's looking through on paper well, it's version. A percentage, but I see yeah. towards the end of cost like that even if back years. out, you have to pay. Yeah, here's seven four hundred. Yeah, he's got one hundred eighty-seven thousand. But they're still pitching. Charlie and I just said I was kind of taken aback by that there's a fee, but um, let me see if I circulated it. I think I circulated this to you folks. Yeah. I don't know how much of that will be offset by the the savings from the the bulk purchase of the fixtures themselves. Yeah. 
Well, we could do our next workshop is um, a week from Thursday. We could spin through this and analyze the numbers. But there's that 3.7 one year as I was talking about. A five year. I did forward it to you if you want to look it over, but for now, next Thursday, they take our fixture count. By the way, it's moving ahead, and council didn't really flag any problem with the contract. He just wanted us to know that that, that fee was in there. So right. Well, so um, we can work on that some more. Anything else, Charles, from your monthly mm, report? Nope. All right. We shall move to Mr. Deputy Mayor Kowalczyk. Are you ready over there? Yep. Uh, start with the Village Green monthly reports. Uh, current balances of the Village Green's related budget accounts. This will be the last one of fiscal year 17, 18. Community, community beautification, we ended up with $2,124.40. Shade Tree Contractual, we were in the hole by $6,350. And the Village Green checking account is $3,331.78. There was a um, another number listed, but we did pay for a bench, um, I be believe beginning of May. And that looks pretty close to the number that we reimbursed for. This, this is being bought by the um, Dutch Gar Old Dutch Garden Club. Um, so they reimburse the entire cost of that bench to slab and plaque. So we have paid for the bench to get a better deal. Um, there were no village green committees held during the month of May. And the village highway department is preparing a list of trees to be pruned or removed along village street right of ways. The village green committee will review the selected trees and confirm the required action and submit recommendations to the Village Board of Trustees for consideration. We did get a notification from a resident on Old Post Road about a tree. I did look at the tree. Um, it didn't look bad, and we'll have an arborist look at that just to confirm. So we're moving forward with that tree as well. The Village of Red Hook Highway Department. Um, the Village Highway Department is currently picking up lawn debris and brush every first and third Monday of the month. Sometimes. You know, it's on Tuesday, but they pick it up. Um, residents are reminded to place lawn debris curbside and place brush debris and grass clippings into separate piles and limit the brush pile sizes to six feet by six feet by six feet and limbs and branches no larger than six inches in diameter. Um, the highway department is also preparing a list of projects to utilize the fiscal year 2018-19 chips paved New York and extreme winter recovery apportionments from the state of New York. Um, so we do have a list uh, we could start reviewing and I'll make that um, part of my report next month and we can discuss what direction we're going for. No scrap metal was sold during the month of May. Um, we ended up at the end of the year with a total revenue of $3,786.60. And since we started this program back in 2007, $25,998.17, or around $26,000 has been generated. And um, anyone interested in donating scrap metal, residents or businesses can contact um, the highway department at 758-8600, leave a message or the clerk's office, and the highway department will assist property owners by picking up scrap metal. The Red Hook Infrastructure and Intermunicipal Task Force monthly reports, the sewer project, phase one, meetings were held on May 4th, 18th, 25th in the Red Hook Village building. We have been reviewing and collecting easements from property owners within the sewer service area. We'll actually be facing a resolution um, coming up in the, in the meeting. Property owners were encouraged to submit signed and notarized easements by May 31st. Property owners who have not submitted easements may be subject to proceedings to acquire the easements to the authority of New York State and Reddick Village laws. Um, the village clerk is available to notarize easements Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And any property owners within the sewer service area with questions regarding their easements can request assistance from the village engineer and attorney. 
And Ed and I and the engineers and the attorneys meet every Friday from about 10 o'clock in the morning to 2 o'clock in the Red Hook Village building on the second floor conference room. So stop by and, and uh, we'll be happy to help you out. We also reviewed the outstanding documents that need to be completed prior to the advertisement for construction bid documents. And they include the USDA Rural Development Letter of Conditions, uh, the New York State EFC comments regarding compliance with the recommended standards for wastewater facilities. And I believe that was executed in, in May. And also the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation documents for acquisition of the Reddit Commons wastewater treatment plant. And regarding the transfer of the existing speedies permit and delineation and validation of the wetland boundary to determine if a freshwater wetland permit is required in that, our attorney did submit to the EC and we're awaiting a response. So we're getting pretty close to finalizing all the requirements to go out the bid. A meeting was held on May 4th um, at the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation Region Office Number 8. Offices in New Pulse, New York, to review the required documents and procedures regarding the acquisition of the Reddit Common Sewage Work Corporation's existing water treatment plant. There were quite a few people, including attorneys and people from the Division of Water, including our engineer, our attorney, Ed, and myself attended. It was a nice, nice break to get out of the village <laughs> for at least a day. Um, Red Hook Water Project Phase 2 meetings were held on May 18th and 25th at the Village Building. We reviewed the work to be completed to decommission the existing Tower Street elevated water storage tank. Work is progressing. Um, hopefully soon we'll be pulling the plug on that tower. And then we're completing the final arrangements and prepare for the closing on the USDA Rural Development and the New York State Environmental Facilities Corporation short-term loan and the Drinking Water um, Infrastructure Improvement Act grant that we did get. So I believe the EFC did close on the grant, right, on the 7th. Yeah. And um, so we're still waiting, I guess, final arrangements with USDA to close on that, that loan. On the task force side, both Charlie and I represent the village. Um, the task force met on May 4th and 25th at the Red Hook Town Hall, and we reviewed um, and discussed Red Hook Town Local Law C. A public meeting was held on May 2nd to address comments by residents and business owners of the Upper Red Hook, um, Hamlet of Upper Red Hook, regarding the proposed Red Hook Town zoning amendments to the Hamlet Business District. This is all town stuff. Um, the public hearing was held at the Town Hall on May 8th. Um, local Law C also included zoning amendments regarding food trucks, amendments to the Reddick Town Traditional Neighborhood District, and amendments to the Hamlet Business District and formula, formula Business Regulations. Um, public hearing was continuing on May 8th, and the Red Hook Town Board voted to approve Local Law C on May 30th. And um, speaking of the Nolans, Bill O'Neill, Harry Cogan, and I presented natural resource preservation, the Red Hook experience, to the Pace University Land Use Law Center's Land Use Leadership Alliance training session on May 11th. The training sessions for ZBA, planning board members, and elected officials was held at the Orange County Arboretum in Montgomery, New York. So it was also good to get out um, there. So I believe that's one more, one more report. And the Red Hook Economic Development Committee, Ed, is the Red Hook Village Liaison. You want to report on this, Ed, or you want me to? I'll, I'll do this. You go ahead. Uh, the EDC meetings were held on May 9th and 23rd at the Red Hook VFW and at the Elmendorf Inn. And they talked about the updates, actions, and member attendance at the Red Hook Town Board, public meetings, and public hearing on May 8th and 30th. Um, so I think there was a lot of people who attended from the EDC at those, and, and they discussed methods to streamline the Reddick Town and Village Planning Boards and Zoning Board of Appeals processes. Um, the EDC also discussed and reviewed updates regarding the Red Hook Business Marketing Initiatives 
and Ed gave updates on the Village of Red Hook sewer project. Um, there were no meetings of the Town of Red Hook Zoning Review Committee. Um, on the Community Preservation Fund, there were no meetings for the Advisory Board. Uh, the current balance of the Community Preservation Fund as of May 31st is $1,043,610.26. So it's always on the move upward. Uh, the Salk Hill Watershed Community, I am a member representing the Village Board. Uh, a State of the Salk Hill Forum was held on May 10th in the Red Hook Town Hall. The following items were presented and discussed, including bacteria from sewage and its impact on the watershed, nutrients in the Salk Hill Watershed, the effects of rose salt on water quality and drinking water, and mitigating flood risks, and how these issues collectively impact our drinking water and the watershed as a whole. And that is my report. Sorry, camera guy. Um, thanks, Brent. What I have on my screen, it's a little easier for me to read than over there, but this is from our bond council, an email to me dated Monday, June 4th, and um, it's EFC writing to him. Uh, our council first name is Dan. They say, Dan, this is to advise you that the um, PFA funding authorization executed by EFC, and this is with the WIA round three grant. It will close this Thursday, June 7th. You may inform your client. That's us accordingly. And um, so our council wrote, and it's a modern day closing where we don't have to be there pen in hand. So council wrote to me and said, please see below as discussed and anticipated the new note and we a grant will close on June 7th. Congratulations. And that, what that means, just to remind everybody, is the phase two water project was, if you round things, 3.8 million, and the grant rounded was 2.28 million. So we have, it brought the $3.8 loan exposure that will finance with the USDA down to 1.5 million ish. So it's a huge step, and that's why he puts in the work. Congratulations. So now, there is a known amount that we have to fund with USDA, and we're working with USDA to get that closing done, so we'll have the, uh, it all set. And that grant was huge. That paid for 60% of the project. Yeah, and, uh, and it's um, what will probably happen, be because EFC was shepherding the WIA grant and their existing loan, they gave us until January 2019 to get it done. The only thing is we budgeted in water, principal and interest. I think it's going to make more not more dollar-wise interest, but it'll be more of an interest payment versus a principal payment because we're going further out. Um, so, uh, but we're working with council and USDA and the new rep to get a closing set. So that'll be a known date in the near future. We're, uh, but we were shooting against the July 8th date, but that's no longer in play because EFC gave another extension. Again, not because anything we're doing, it was just more they were the ones controlling the 2.28 million against the 3.8, so they, they worked with us, which is good. But thank you, Brent. When Brent talked about chips there and the highway foreman has given us mm -hmm. some information. Um, There's some like paving some, projects. Some paving, crack ceiling. Catch basins. Um, yeah. crack, crack ceiling, cis ceiling basically phase two water roads to new roads there so that's a good preventative measure from yeah and premature um, deterioration so in the next next couple of weeks we're going to use them for the in-kind work to get our ev charging stations set in our parking lot so that's underway i think the component upright parts arrived i haven't heard if the pier arrived yet that they somebody did. took them they're not there they put them in the shed i think or, oh. yeah but um so that's underway too and the highway guys are working on it because there is an in-kind match with the DEC money. So, But let's move to regular business. Um, it was funny, I was looking and teasing Cindy when I was looking at the agenda today. Um, we, we've really moved into an acronym world. If you look at... I don't know what any of this is. I know. It's on purpose, you know. So <laughs> but uh, we, have, we have TAP and C CMAQ, Billing Department, CEO, ZRC, GBD, LED. But anyway, George knows what they are. He's been here all the time. But we'll re-explain. But one is more straight English, English language there. 
Number one, school campus restriction. We heard the public present, and they, I did circulate to all of you the email and different things that were coming up. And I do feel that the school campus is an asset to the village, and I think we have a pretty strong and responsible dog control law that they should have mimicked. I would think that our residents should be able to walk their dogs as long as they're acting properly as responsible citizens and cleaning up after their dog. Um, the two thoughts that came up in the public discourse was maybe the public side, uh, wrong word, the, the paved sidewalks within the campus. Yeah, I don't think the school wants free running, free running dogs anywhere, and I don't think our law is consistent with that either. The one question is it's really not our grounds, not our direct responsibility, but um, and that one question was asked by the audience. Most of our law implies that the dog owner controls the dog within the owner's own premises, but the school's not owning the dog. It's visitors with the dog. Um, but I think we were circulating something. I'm pretty opposed to having a public trash bin for dog waste for the poor school guys to empty. But I would like to craft a letter and go on a record to the school board even before the meeting and just saying we would feel that it's a campus setting or people do use it whether you're riding a bike walking or walking a pet um, uh, whether there be support for something like that where we just uh, ask that they rethink the process and uh, we could suggest that they just follow a standard leash law type wording and uh, <laughs> I think as long as we yeah. also you know acknowledge that it's it is their Board of Ed's decision you know to create policy and um, you know we're speaking mm. but I think from they the citizenry but it's it's their policy basically I think they should have considered us and I don't think we're disagreeing it's just because even with the school theater they tend to still call it an auditorium, but I keep making the argument, hey, it's a community theater. You know, it's not not just for school, not just for auditorium. Um, and I think they would listen to us. They seem to be, you know, good colleagues with us on other projects. And so something yeah, not too harsh, but staying, uh, it's an important exercise point for our residents and our residents who own dogs. And if they're responsible, why penalize them? Would there be consensus on that? If we did something? I bring my dog there, yeah. not during school hours yeah. and not on the track. Mm. And not to be able to cut through there is, uh, means that if I take my dog on a, anywhere other than a walk around the block, mm. I'm on the main drag out there. And yeah. it's, it's not as much fun if you, you know, if you're away from the traffic and everything. So I think it would be a wonderful thing yeah. if they would reconsider uh, what I would think is a rather abrupt decision yeah, here it seemed like they acted like school principals to me kid you're a bad kid you have detention you know, it was like they threw everybody into detention in my mind it's like what but and yeah i mean i'd like to echo that there's a sort of safety component to it in that it's nice to be able to walk through the school property and not be on the street mm -hmm. and you know it's a it is a genuinely a, a an asset to the village that mm. that open space around the schools and mm -hmm. to start curtailing what we can and can't do you know reasonably uh, and you know being able given the opportunity to police ourselves as opposed to being told that we just can't do something there I think is right. it's unfortunate if, if I craft the letter get it off to them before the board meeting um, and if anybody feels so inclined, you could go you know, to the board. But I'm not so sure. I, I don't know. But was it a real board vote or just some administrative decision based on input? Yeah, I haven't heard the details. But it didn't sound like it was a board vote from what I was hearing from the audience. But I don't know if they would know. So, all right, so uh, just to, I guess we could say an emotion. The mayor's authorized to craft a letter stating that we view it as an open campus and any restrictions on pet walking should be consistent with the village law, the village leash law, and clean up after your pet, something to incorporate that. And I'll move. We're good. Uh, all in favor? All right. Thank, all right. thank you. Bar transportation meeting, our two prime guests left, but um, what I could update all of you on, I hinted at with them, but we did meet with the bar transport people. They had consulted with 
folks other than transportation. Um, they can run the, the shuttle and stay on Route 9 with that change in the town hall. The town indicated as long as the bus can make the swing, they were okay with it. And the way I look at it, that is public property. And that was one of the downfalls earlier. We had been looking in the past for where can we turn that bus without getting it into private property. Um, and there was no solution. Um, they were cooperative, they listened, and what I put, I crafted something. They did restate that approximately 150 Bard students live in the village and travel to the campus daily for classes. Then we have the reverse flow of kids coming to visit the merchants and food places here. Um, and then they do provide it as a cost free. That was one thing that came up versus the county transit bus. And they say it carries about 300 students per day to the village. Um, and I see it, like we said at the last meeting, it does reduce the need for private passenger vehicle traffic and therefore reduces pollution and traffic in the village. And the students, the resident students are, they need the transportation It mutually benefits them and us as I see it. Um, we, I did reach out to the new commissioner, that might not be the right word, administrator of Dutchess County Public Transit, but we haven't matched up to talk face to face. Um, you know, I'd explore with him if they could look at a reduced ride rate, but it won't forego the barred shuttle. It might just give an ability to cut less shuttles, cut to less shuttles rather. Um, and the big thing is with us shutting down the print side, they'll stay, the shuttle route will have to be adjusted and move from the side streets to the main Route 9 corridor. And to do that, what I want to do is um, we sat with the Bard fellow and right in front of Village Hall, it's hardly ever used for parking and there's already an upright sign there that says two hour parking. And I talked to the highway foreman too. We could have the bus pull off there and discharge southbound, then we'll head to the town lot, turn around, come back northbound. And they could stop over in front of the credit union. We have a sign there that says no parking here to corner, which is ambiguous and really nobody ever parks anywhere there. And we could mount a similar sign there, bus stop, shuttle stop, or something with the words in it. Um, but to be up front, we'd have to codify it, you know, which would take a little bit of timeline with us like any law change. Um, and. Yeah, you know, we'd have to name, you know, 75 feet here and whatever, 75 feet there. Um, but looking at it with the highway foreman, he feels it would work here, uh, would work there. And then it could be a third or an ancillary stop. Apparently a lot of students get off and on over at the Church Street corner. It was one reason they cut down that way. There's a lot of apartments right on that West Market Street area. Um, and there is a spot in front of, it's right at the corner of St. John's and West Market. It's tagged no parking here to corner, and it's um, but it's in a more private area. I would say like the the adjoining business is a law firm there, and um, uh, where would the students congregate? It's it's more like sidewalk. Whereas here we have in front of the village hall, we have some benches and we have a trash receptacle and we have a camera, and across the street it's a wide plaza too for people to stand in front of the credit union area there, where you wouldn't be like crunched on a sidewalk. Whereas over by the law firm building, it's it's more just of a sidewalk there. Um, but Bard did seem interested in having the bus able to stop there. Um, so what I crafted was something to get us moving forward. And on the Bard side, what they would have to do, like I mentioned earlier, right now they're on a 40 minute schedule. The early morning does not go down to Hannaford. Um, but then midday to late afternoon, they, the route does turn around to Hannaford, so they wouldn't even be using the town for those midday type stops. And, um, but this would be every run, you know, it's not, we did have some ideas, should we run some down the side street and cut others off after a certain hour? Um, but this, this can work keeping them out on the main drag. And, um, Is this gonna disrupt traffic though, if, if the bus stops are, well, there's is, is there, there a space for the bus to pull over and traffic to continue through, or will that then stop traffic? Obviously. Well, it won't, it won't stop traffic, but it will be a bus pulling off 
so you'll have to slow down while the bus pulls off and gets out of the way, and then he'll have to pull out. So you um, won't be able to go past a, the bus. Oh, you can. Yeah. You can. Yeah. Okay. The loop uh, bus. The loop bus does that now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have to be slow. Right. Yeah. Go. I mean, obviously, but I just didn't mm -hmm. know. If and you're, no, you're stuck behind a no, bus no, or, okay. no, it can pull up. It was really odd today. It wasn't a barred bus, but I came in here setting up for the meeting, and there was some sort of transit shuttle bus with bike racks on the front, but it didn't say Dutchess County. And it was parked there, and I was watching, and even a big DJ Vosper truck got past them. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, I was like, wow. It's like, yeah, but it wasn't that weird blue, you know, it was like just kind of a white color. Like, oh, they might might have been a replacement or something, but it's uh, but anyway, it was there. Um, but they would have to change their schedule, and like I was saying when in the earlier phase, if there was a good time to do that, it's now when it's the summer and there's not a big demand, and they can get the word out. And um, so I told him I would talk to the board. Him being the director of transit, like I said, I did call the county. But to me, the county is a side story. You know, if we can do something with them, that's good. But. It's not going to change the immediate need. But I'd be inclined to move, indicating to Bard that you know, we'll, our intention would be to go that way, but then we'd have to codify it, and, but in the interim, get a sign up. And, but I don't see it cutting parking for any business because no. nobody parks here. And even over there, it's um, pretty restricted as it is. And you've got... Um, I guess the kids are in the habit of picking up the north. Like, if you want to ride from here to Hannaford, you jump it here. <coughs> hey, if you're trying to get to campus, you'd probably wait for the northbound trip and grab it over it by the credit union, you know, instead of hopping here, turning around on the bus and going over. But, but to me, it's it gets them off the side of the street. It's I talked to them about the size of the bus, and they're like, yeah, they feel like they need a 40-passenger bus. They said, based on the loads they carry, they need the ability. Because I stressed it in that that was one of the problems. It's just so big for a side street. But I would like to take some steps. Maybe, like I said, I crafted a resolution just to indicate so we could show Bard we're okay with it. But I want to make sure a we're okay with it. You know, before before we tell him that. But um, it seemed like the cleanest, best way to to do something. Yep. And uh, I was. Happy that the town reconfiguration would work, so that was good. But if you look at the resolution part of the wording, it's um, we'd have to codify it, install some signs to make a south bar, southbound barred shuttle stop on South Broadway. I don't know if I stated it clearly, but I'd like to ask the county to also move their little tag to here too, so there's not too independent. Even now, there's I don't know how they picked that spot for theirs because you can never park a bus where they have their little tag up there. Um, but when I was putting this together, um, we certainly know where in front of Village Hall is. And then um, across the street, there's a no parking area at, we'd have to fill in a blank there. Um, it's called Firehouse Plaza, but we, we, for the codification, we'd have to get more specific. Um, and then at that third point, the no parking zone at, West Market and um, St. John would be, it seemed like they thought a lot of kids, a lot of bar students tend to jump on it over there as it's turning off Church Street, so it could be. I think all things considered, it's, it's a much wiser move to congregate out here. Uh, yeah. A month or so ago, I was pulling into the parking lot and there were five or six students waiting for the bus standing in the parking places, the mm. empty parking places. I was trying to pull in. Mm. Two of them had headphones on and had no clue that I was trying to pull into the place. Mm. And I had to get out and go, <laughs> can you can you move? And they go, oh. Mm. So, you know, it's, so here, it, yeah. it's, it's a little more congested over there. Yeah. If the bus stops at the beginning of the street here, nobody can pull in. You know, oh, you know, the old yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I think all things considered, this is a yeah. much more logical spot. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Seems like it gets. So, I did in the resolution, Cindy'd have to give us a number, but um, 
as we title designate bus slash shuttle stops on South Broadway, Broadway and West Market. So 13. 13. 13. Um, a bunch of whereas is where we just cite the approximate number of students and the, the travel rate and that we feel it's beneficial to both the village, the village merchants, the village residents, and the students to have a shuttle. We'd somehow like to get the county triggered to do something with us, um, but we do need to adjust the shuttle route. Um, we've met with Bard, and this seems to be something they can live with too, and the town has said it's okay. So in the resolution part, we might need to help fill in the blank here, but be it resolved that the village of Reddick will take steps to specifically codify but install signs to mark a southbound barred shuttle stop on South Broadway in front of Village Hall and a northbound barred shuttle stop at the current no parking area at, I put in Firehouse Plaza, um, and a supplemental stop at the no parking zone at in West Market and St. John Street would probably be a good designator. I think in the codification, we're going to have to say, you know, whatever the length of the bus is, plus a few feet at those locations, just so the police can enforce something. Um, but I'd like to try to use the existing, it looks like each time we don't have to plant a new pole and a new anything, it just will tack on to an existing upright pole that sits on the Route 9 side. And the, um, the village will direct the county agency to move its stop identifier south to the same village hall area. I would offer a motion to adopt that resolution number 13. Is there any further discussion? Do you want to change the word but to and at, at the end of the first sentence? Yeah, what I was trying to get it was a timeline. I think I'd like to um, not wait for the codification, which could be with, with our legal process for public hearing and this and that and the other thing. Um, I'd like to get them able to start using it as soon as they can. But and could work, right? Kind of. I guess I'm trying to um, just uh, steps to codify. Doing both, you know, mm -hmm. doesn't say anything about order or timeline. But pardon me, I'm sorry. We're not saying anything about order or timeline. It's just mm -hmm. these are two actions that we'll be taking care of mm -hmm. at some point. In I'm good with it. Well, what if we put codify with installation of signs? Something I'd like to keep it going on, you know, with the consideration that this discussion, you know, we'll just do the requisite codification, but somehow get the process going. Can you think of? Suggestions, any there, Mr. Trapper, Mr. Brent, or Mr. Lane? Good. Hmm. Either one. Um, what did you say, Brent? I, I didn't catch it. with any word you want there. Mm -hmm. let's, let's get this passed. <laughs> let's see. Jay, you're our English professor. What do you think? Let's see. Specific kind of I, uh, And. <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to convey is I don't know that uh, I'd like to get the process going. In other words, order signs, get them up, and then get our law changed almost concurrently. You okay if we do it that way? I mean, it's um, you know, not. They will be doing both. Yeah. You guys okay with that, everybody? Okay. Okay, so and instead of but. Is what we're saying. Any other thoughts, discussion? Call to vote then. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Let's see. So we did that. We did that. I'm going to throw around those acronyms TAP and CMAQ. Um, I had the good fortune to go to Dutchess County, excuse me, mm. New York State DOT, was it last week sometime? Um, you guys might remember when we did the safe routes to school, what, eight years ago, whenever that was, Brent? Um, that was a TAP program, which is called the Transportation Alternatives Program. And CMAQ is Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Improvement Program. Um, 
I heard another acronym flipped about down there called the PFLAP, but that doesn't appear on the agenda. It was something like the Mukta, right, Jet? Uh, it's a, but anyway, it was held by DOT, which is where George used to work, and it was probably one of the most boring meetings I've been at in five years. <laughs> and uh, uh, I see the Panda people smiling, so they're paying a little bit of attention back there. But uh, in the essence, in essence, I was half looking with the BART shuttle, transportation, you know, is there something that the state's laying out there that maybe we could jump into? But it turns out the answer is no. Um, when we did the safe routes to school, one of our unique situations then, we had a shovel-ready project, and essentially you need shovel-ready projects, and it seems to me like both of these funding mechanisms, you almost need a big enough municipality where you have engineers on staff who are building and designing projects that are like on the shelf, ready for you to just look for funding and grab. Whereas right now our operating style is more use engineers about certain funding we know about and try to not, we're not necessarily shovel ready, but we're trying to qualify and apply for the WIA and the CFA for say the parking lot improvements and things. So long story short, I wanted to tell you I went, um, couldn't find any money that we could grab at it. And, uh, but I was down there representing us. Um, and that word shovel ready was the big thing. Next item, building department appoint new CEO. It's just a housekeeping thing. Um, we are utilizing the firm of Z3 Consulting to, to give us building inspector and zoning enforcement officers. Um, they're moving some of their staff around and as if we were using at our appointment phases, we named Gary Beck and James Greaves. Greaves is leaving to do a different municipality. It's an internal thing with that company. We're gonna get a fellow, Don Coker, but just to have, so he has the authority to sign building permits and violation notices and so forth. We should acknowledge that he exists and appoint him to act on the village's behalf. So his name is spelled C-O-C-K-E-R. He pronounces it Coker, but he's a certified building inspector and, code and a zoning enforcement guy. He comes, again, through Gary Beck's company, Z3, and what they'll be doing is having office hours on Wednesdays, and then he'll do whatever inspections are needed and so forth. Um, it doesn't seem like it's anything negative or bad. They're just switching their staff around to meet what they need to do. I talked to Jay. Jay knows him somewhat indirectly, but uh, yeah, I think he helped us a couple years ago when our building department was overloaded and he came in with Z3 back then. And, uh, but I put a motion on the floor that the Z3 uh, affiliate building inspector, I guess we'll call him the right name, code enforcement officer and zoning enforcement officer be changed from um, James Greaves to Donald Coker, effective tonight, you know, June 11th. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? It's more pro forma. We all good. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks. Um, number five, we talked about the zoning review committee and the GBD changes. We had that brief public hearing to expand the moratorium four months. Um, I think it's more logistical as we just get that wording changes and in form. My thinking is, I do have a resolution, but we do have to get the 239M from the county and a few things. And then, um, like we said before, if, if the board could think more at, about GBD, general business district, and any demolition issues that we might want to address while we're in the current phase, but you, that'd be independent of tonight. That's one of the ZRC to talk about. Will we be able to pass a resolution at the workshop? Yeah. Yeah. Um, LED street update. Essentially, Charlie, we went into that in, when he was doing his report, so we'll talk more about that at the workshop. One thing I added, um, speaking of resolutions, and when Brent did his report, we had, um, we have two boxes of sewer easements upstairs where, um, we're pushing to get them all in here. We have a few stragglers and we're reminding folks to get in. Like Brent said, we have Friday sessions where engineers, lawyers, and us are here for any technical questions, but we're getting toward the end game where we need to go to bid. But one thing, each easement has places for the grantor to sign and the grantee to sign, and um, we 
being a grantee of the village, I get to hand sign 135 documents or something. And unfortunately, there's about six places to sign them. So uh, I know I have one, uh, but I think our lawyer said I can't do that for some reason. Can't do that. You can't do that. She said I can't. Oh, wow. but I was like, man, I'm gonna be like be paralyzed. Um, and our lawyer, being extremely technical, she said, well, mayor get an authorization from the board to sign all the easements. So do you guys have all this in front of you? The, yep. uh, maybe the mellifluous J. Trap. you want to read a couple of whereas's? And, uh, okay, let me see here. Let me get the appropriate. Uh, we could hand it down. I guess we know it's number 14. Uh, I could send you mine in case you Okay. Got one? Uh, shall I just start? Uh, this will be number 14 at the whereas. Is. Yeah, please. Yes. Whereas the village of Red Hook is establishing a municipal sewer system to serve the village pursuant to Article 14 of the New York State Village Law. And whereas the village is seeking to construct the sewer system in phases with the first phase encompassing the general business district and contiguous areas, parenthetic, the sewer project. And whereas a map and plan of the permanent sewer project with plans and specifications for the sewer treatment plant has been prepared by CT Mail Associates dated February 15, 2017, last revised May 8, 2017, entitled Map, Plan, and Report, Village of Red Hook Sewer System, parenthetic, the map and plan. And whereas on February 8, 2016, the Village Board adopted a negative declaration finding that the sewer project as proposed would not result in any significant adverse environmental impacts and that a draft environmental impact statement would not be prepared. And whereas the Village has been obtaining easements over private property for installation of Phase 1 of the sewer project in accordance with the map and plan, and whereas the village has received the following partially executed easements, which have been reviewed by the project engineer and attorney for completeness. Uh, shall I go through uh, oh, the... the uh, uh, I would say not. There's a bunch of them. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Parenthetic, there, suffice to say that there are a number of numbers yeah. here, <laughs> ending with parenthetic, the easements. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Trustees of the Village of Red Hook that the Mayor and Deputy Mayor are hereby authorized to execute the easements and associated tax filing forms and cause them to be recorded in the office of the Dutchess County Clerk. Be it further resolved that the Mayor is hereby authorized to execute a hold harmless agreement consistent with the terms of the sewer easement with the parish of St. Christopher and St. Sylvia. There you Thank have you. it. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. What Thank we're you. looking at is that one paragraph, they list each, each easement by number that's ready to be signed. And What's kind of interesting, they are indexed by number within the boxes and all the spreadsheets. So rather than have Jay read every number there, we we concurred that he didn't have to. Um, I would introduce it myself as a motion to be seconded by somebody. Second. Was that Brent saying that? Hey. There is one small typo. There's D. an and. Yeah, the D. So just so that it gets caught somewhere. Saw, the the fourth whereas. Yeah. At the end. I saw each hand kind of move. We're all pretty good at that. Thanks, though. Um, yeah, so the good news is on page two, I don't have to sign every one. I can make Brent sign a few. I saw that. That's good. I you you got to ask me this. Nobody <laughs> could understand what he wrote, though, I don't think. But anyway, let's see. Um, anyway, we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All right, so it's all in favor? Aye. Thank you, everybody. I think we can forego the executive session. Um, we have hit all the things we needed to hit, and we could go to our normal public comment for the public who's more in tune with our meetings and doesn't mind sitting here all night. Do you have any? She's behind you with a little. Um, 
You had mentioned before that the uh, is it on? I think, yep. yep. That uh, the fire department is the building was owned by the village. Is yeah. it the property or the building itself? It's a tech. The property for sure. Right. And, and then we have a lease with them for the building. And the way it works is they built it at their cost in 1985-ish. It's it's in the lease, and um, the way it's worded is. It's, I think, a 50-year lease, and then it can renew, and if they choose not to relocate, or how should I say it, wrong words, if they choose to relocate and not stay there, it clearly becomes the villages. But the way our inter attorney interprets that is, if you're leasing it, it's we are really the landlord. So the, the, the lease contains terms of the occupancy and what they cannot and can do and so forth. So it's a hybrid of... At some point in the 80s, they moved from here to there, built it. I don't really know where all the you know, we I haven't researched where the money came from, but it was. It would seem to me that if they funded it, they own the building, just like down in Rhinebeck, where the church owns half the village and the people who own houses yeah. are just leasing. Now, the way it's worded, the landlord is the village. The you know it's it's a, it's a real. Yeah, lease. you call them landlord, but I'm just i was just curious because as yeah. far as I know, the village didn't build the building. Yeah, but one of the things they have to bring, because one of the provisions of the lease is that they have to show that it's insured, and even that implies if it were to burn down, we need to be sure they can build a new firehouse. You know, so it's, um, and it's built into the lease. Well, you so be, as a landlord, you're protecting yourself because you'll have to demolish the building, what's left of it. That would yeah. cover the cleanup, and they decide if they relocate it someplace else, they would mm. they'd have like to, said, it'd be on them. If they had the insurance, the money would go to them. Yeah, but when legal looked at it, we own land. They built the building, but it's a lease to the village. You know, it's it's the word is a lease. It's not a. Well, you can lease, you can lease property and put a building on it, but mm -hmm. usually when something goes on the property, it becomes if it's permanent. It might go belong to the. Uh, what's in Scotland when the laird owns the? Uh, is there a, what's that called? Would you have a cottage on the manor? People don't own anything. Yeah. 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 But anyway, the, okay, I, I was just no, it's, throwing it's, it's a little bit question, question about that. But it's called a lease. So. And they, that's, what else you got? Anything? That's it. Okay, thanks. With that, I think we need a motion to pay bills. I know in the packets there is some sewer expense. Did everybody get a look at them? And then there's two packets of May 31 and June 11. Um, I know we got through them. We'll have Cindy work on a few of those questions we had on the report. Uh, so we need a motion to pay bills after audit. Is there some? Is there a second? second? All in favor? Aye. And then Mr. Brent, are you ready to? Get it, baby. I am ready. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn this evening's meeting. I would second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good night, everybody. Second that motion. <laughs>